Orion Atlas Pro weighs 42 pounds, but that includes the tripod. And hey, no gentlemen, I hate to interrupt, but doggone, it is time. Right now, it's 11 o'clock in the morning on what is today, the 16th of October for the next week, is Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit Astro Hour, shortened to SBAU Astro Hour, on YouTube. It's a one hour vlog. We do live every Monday morning, 11 o'clock, for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, South Central Coast's Long time telescope and astrophysics club where Alex Filipenko of UC Berkeley had his start. I'm your host, vice president of the club, Ron Heron. How in the world did I get that title? I learned Very a lot from me. gentlemen. <laughs> we'll talk. I learned a lot from you guys. I feel like I'm getting a free course. It's once a week, one hour in the physics department out of Broido Hall. I introduce you to the guys here in a minute. You can watch us on YouTube, as I said, you can comment. And one of our uh, guys will tell you what you're saying. Come to our first Friday meetings. You're always welcome. First Friday of the month, we have a speaker and we have great uh, stuff going on. God, daily. Uh, what do we have? Uh, Saturday, 2,000 people. To watch 2,100, the for Chuck told me. 2,173. How many? 20? 2,173. Okay, and then Saturday night star party, we had over 300. 331. And Friday night at the meeting, it was a little more than half full, I think. It was close to full, wasn't it? Oh, no, it was two Fridays ago that we had the first meeting. What's the meeting, everybody? President Jerry Wilson, going to run Good again. Good morning. You, you hope to be president again? You're going to run? You're unopposed this December, my friend? I don't know. You're putting the ballot together. That's true. I am. I'm running the show. Jerry has been president for five or six years. He's married to Pat Forge, and he's too damn good for us. I got to tell you, he's the man that runs this uh, event we do here. Chuck McPartland is our SBAU outreach coordinator. I read somewhere that he goes out 200 times a year. That's more than twice. That, we that was pre-COVID. Oh, okay. Not these days. It's 230, yeah. And right now, he and his wife, Pat McPartland, who is merchandise manager for the club, are holding down, I think, secretarial duties. That'll all change in a couple of months, in the new year. No Tom Winnemore today, editor of our newsletter. He's off. But uh, we have Bruce Murdoch, who's joined us, longtime supporter and telescope enthusiast. Telescope freak, actually. He goes crazy. He lives, he sleeps with his. Big <laughs> He's president. No, I don't think so. My wife wouldn't put up with that. <laughs> His wife is Bonnie, and she, like all the lovely ladies of the club, are supporters. Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. You doing anything? <clears throat> no, there's uh, the general manager of the Arlington Theater is now on leave, whatever that means. Oh, and so, so we're having okay. difficulty getting them to commit to uh, a particular Saturday. So, so far this month, we don't know which Saturday, if any, we'll have our open console. Well, you know, it's a it's a darn shame that all those pipes go pretty much unused pretty much all the time. <laughs> well, the, fantastic the problem organ. is that, you know, if we put on a presentation <clears throat> and like we charge $10 admission, which is probably too low, uh, we lose about $2,000 on each performance. By the time you pay for the artist, you pay for his lodging, you pay for his uh, travel. You pay to get the organ tune. You pay for this, the union stage crew, and you have to pay for the theater. All that stuff. So, we've had a, a good um, arrangement with the International Film Festival the last several years, where once a year they put on a silent movie for free to the public, and they take care of all expenses. Well, I think it's time for AI. So get a robot in. <laughs> yeah. Don't have to worry about it. Hey, look who's on the screen with us. Tim Crawford, resident lens and telescope expert. Howdy. And as my Avast anti-tracking obliterates my screen, you didn't see it, but there's a big blue box. I took it off. Uh, Tim's married to Karen, and he's got a uh, large manhole cover on, mounted on the wall behind him. But that sucker <laughs> falls, you're in deep <laughs> trouble. I got it. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's All my right. pitch for my la la latest uh, telescope. I got you. Uh, this hour. Is it on a rounded edge, turned edge? <laughs> oh, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I swear you guys uh, get the incredible things behind you. I don't know how you do it. You do a green screen, blue screen. That's what uh, Chuck is doing with the flag no, of your No, brain, it's just right? you, you can select backgrounds and zoom. 
Yeah. Well, how does it obliterate? Why doesn't it obliterate you? Why just the background of you? It's got it's got some processing in there that tries to figure out what's in yeah. the background and what's in the background. Depending yeah, on your actual background, it, it does a good job or a bad job. Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's obliterating my cat here. Shoulder. I've got a cat right here and it's not showing because it's black. Yeah. Wait a minute. That looks like, okay. I'm not going to tell you what I think that looks like. <laughs> okay. Do we have another Amuamua going through our solar system? This may be a distant comet. <laughs> distant. Yeah, we're going to talk about this. That was years ago, Ron. Well, that's, did you read his talking points? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know it was years ago, but that okay. wasn't a comet, I guess. We'll have to talk about this. We will. It's his first item. Oh, in the, the, the comet about. was years ago also. But this one is a comet. It has a tail. I guess. We'll talk. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, cool. It's coming through the solar system. We're spotting things from distant uh, places. Finally getting around to making that giant Magellan telescope down in Arizona. It's going to go to South America. For the holiday, my God, screaming skull cluster. Yep, there's Halloween in space. Into the region of the Great Square, you check out the Deerlick galaxies and the Stevens Quintet and our waxing crescent moon this week. Teapot of Sagittarius in the center, some celestial nebulae, Fleming's trend, triangular wisp, and the German zodiac light. Well, gentlemen, now that I've introduced you, shall we have some sillies to start things off, keep us in a good mood? These are the uh, forwarded silly science cartoons from our president, including, get ready, this one. <laughs> this is uh, Peanuts, Peppermint, Patty, and Math. Yeah. <laughs> Only in math can you buy 60 cantaloupes and nobody asks, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> That's similar to the problem with a joke that begins with a priest, a rabbi, and a Muslim emir going to a bar, as if that would ever happen. This one I don't recall seeing. Is it okay? Are those aliens meeting the lady in her china collection? Yeah. Inside. Oh. Okay. China close out. You're reading the uh, sign on the window backwards. It's lovely, madam, but we're looking for something much bigger. With light speed capabilities, okay, a yes, saucer. This was sent to me by Tim. <laughs> yeah, so did you? I, it, it must have come out this morning. I haven't checked. Yeah, it was out at yeah. the doctor's office. All right, this is the holiday line butt in Santa Claus trying to one up the witch and a turkey for their big days. He's known for that. Looks too drunk, doesn't he? Okay. <laughs> I didn't see this one. That's great. The layers of the earth. Now, this is, an, oh, these are kind of funny. You want to read some of these? Kinder toy capsule in the middle, going out secret core, inner core, outer core, nougat <laughs> seeds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they have somehow have all that down, don't they? I like the core from holy. <laughs> this is from XKCD. XKCD, what does that mean? It's a website. Oh. Uh, they great. do technical cartoons. Um, some of them very clever, some of them very mysterious. But anyway, the core is a kinder toy capsule, uh, German for child. Like okay. kinder, toy, right? kinder toy. Kinder yeah. toy means child? Yeah. Or, okay. Well, no, kinder, German for child. Okay, is there a reason why that goes to the core? No. No, no I just get that now. Uh, this I was a clever core. Yeah. Okay. Layers of the earth. <laughs> There's layers of nougat, pith. Oh, God, yeah. Seeds, and of course, insulation, cork, cork. cytoplasm, guacamole, <laughs> mechanical <laughs> high, high back layer, a vitreous humor, filler, deep mantle, upper mantle, lithosphere crust, 50 50 blend. <laughs> Someone just uh, noodling with their uh, pen. Okay, and moving the rock up the hill, what's the mythological story on this? Is that Samson or Hercules? That's Sisyphus. Sisyphus. Oh, okay, so I have to get to the uh, Lagrangian point. Okay, there is one on mountaintops, I guess, huh? He did something that uh, committed the sin of pride, hubris, and he was doomed to roll this large rock up a mountain forever. And every time he gets near the top, he loses control of it, and it rolls down again. He has to go get it. Is that right? Those so he set himself really... a goal here. Okay. And what's his name? Spell it. Sisyphus. Oh, okay. I've heard of him. 
This one I don't recall getting. What are they? A bunch of uh, old classic stuff we grew up with. This one was sent to me also recently. I forget who. Must Edgar, be. I think. It's oh, what? I think it was Edgar. Yeah, that's right. Edgar Ocampo. Oh, I, I see. Edgar has all the past uh, Instamatics and regular telephones and alarm clocks that ring, ganging up on the poor uh, iPhone. Uh, the, iPhone in the middle. It took all are our they time. up to 15 now? Yep. Probably. <laughs> How'd you like to sink all your money into a watch company? Watches are going away, too. I never I did. I don't know. Watch. Well, on my wrist, they, they chafe. Well, if you, I watch YouTube a lot, and one of the things that seems to be in vogue anyway is very uh, high-end watches like uh, Rolex. Oh, yeah, that has everything on it. Yeah. Some of those things will never go away. They're like, like wearing things. your iPhone on your wrist. Uh -huh. Okay, this is the IKEA furniture from hell. Good luck, your DIYs. <laughs> yeah, apparently yeah, like Escher bought IKEA. Yeah, love to see the look on the carpenter's face if he opened his business, his plans to this. <laughs> Makes you think maybe they could build something that looks like those things. But no, no, it's not possible. <laughs> oh, it is, Bruce. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. But yours, but yours had a turned edge. <laughs> you have to be drunk or high to do that. And speaking of nostalgia, is it Calvin or Hobbes? Calvin's this is kid, right? this is the comic strip that the little kid is Calvin. Yeah, and Dad comes ro uh, walking up to him. He says, "Ah, playing a record, I kid. I'll show you something interesting. Compare a point on the label with a point on the record's outer edge. They both have a complete circle in the same amount of time, right?" Calvin says, "Yeah, but the point on the record's edge has to make a bigger circle in the same time, so it goes faster. See, two points on one disc move at two different speeds, even though they both make the same revolutions per minute." Can you leave that on the screen for a second? And he blew the kid's mind. Uh, here's what I here's let's see. Um, I'll just have to. I wrote this down because this has always made me wonder. The human ear. Can hear a sound up to how many cycles? How many? About sixteen to twenty thousand cycles. Okay, oh, that means how old you are. That yeah. means if you happen to hit that tone, that note, on a song on the inside track of an album, which goes thirty-three and a third RPM, right? Right. Uh, one second, or sixteen thousand squiggles would have to be in a an arc. On the vinyl, it's about. I know where you're going with this, and yes, you do get higher fidelity on the rim compared to the center. Well, well is it a matter of if you could see it through a microscope? Could you see them? That's a that's a lot of little squiggles to cut. You into can certainly room. see this. You can certainly see the squiggles. I've seen photographs of the squiggles. Wow! In fact, there's two two squiggles per groove, right. one on one side and one on the other. That gets you the stereo. Yeah, that's true too. Or, or try quad; it goes four different directions. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. I don't know how they cut that those suckers. But so the 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 key question then is, in this vein, no matter how many songs there are on a record on an album, the old 40, 33 and a third album, um, no matter how many songs there are, how many grooves are there on the record each side? It's always the same. One. One. <laughs> You'll be surprised how many people haven't thought about that. Not necessarily. There have I've gotten what's called electronic transcriptions where you had to put the needle in the middle to yeah. cut to or whatever. But when I was in okay. college in the uh boarding house that I lived, uh, which had a lot of engineers in it, uh one of the questions is what's the length of the uh track on a 33 and a third RPM record? God, I, who knows? And we that worried very... about that and worried about it. And finally, uh, <clears throat> one of the guys says, well, we know the area and we know the width of the groove. Therefore, you know the length of the groove. The you know, easy. Well, yeah, some, sometimes there's a big blank with a, a groove that transits that blank area very quickly. Yeah, yeah that, and when there's different bands on there. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I have it a question. depends on whether you just measure it as though it's a single uniform groove or whether you follow each of the wiggles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I have gonna... a quick question on this. Would the do the outside groove, since it's traveling faster out on the outside, do you go do you transition through um 
towards the center slower on the outside than you do on the inside? No, the, the RPM is the same everywhere. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that's a definite question. And this uh, that's going to have to be a topic in the future, Jerry, as well. Okay. As will Fourier transform versus Courier transform. Now, this is a nice representation of a Fourier transform. Here we are in uh, time space. This is time axis. And here we are in frequency space. This is the inverse of time. It's frequency. Well, is that an Amazon delivery on the bottom? or is so, that... Yes, this is another kind of transform where some, someone wished your package and transformed it into this. <laughs> and that's known as a courier. Yeah, courier transform. <laughs> courier versus courier. About a couple of those. Okay, we have a couple of distant giant uh, aliens uh, in their laboratory, and they've got some samples around them. Zorak, you idiot! You mixed incompatible species in the Earth terrarium, which is on the top shelf. That's a man versus a bear. I can barely yeah. tell. Mm -hmm. All right, those are mixed species. Back to Peppermint Patty. Yeah, that's not Peppermint Patty. Oh, that's uh, what is her name? Lucy. Lucy. No, that's not, no, not Lucy. Lucy. Sally. Oh. Sally. What is it? Sally? Sally, yeah. Who was oh, Peppermint? that's the younger sister. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't there a Peppermint Patty in the... A patty? There is a Peppermint yes. Patty, yeah. But it's not her. I thought that was her. Well, we got a new Mua Mua coming through. Is that our first... Mm -hmm. You want to just go in line of your talking points? It's sure. I don't know when we read them, but I transfer them to one piece of paper here. Well, it's not a long skinny one. It's not a Havana cigar this time, right? Well, this one, this is a Mua Mua. I know. This oh. is from, what is it, 2020 or something? It went through? 2017. 2017. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was first. Our and, uh, but we're going to talk about Borisov, which is, came through in 2019, because they have determined through a, 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 a ideal analysis, a simple analysis, they've come up with some strange facts about it. Not strange in any kind of science fiction or UFO way but mathematical strange. So this is a Muumuu, which you all remember. Uh, it was uh, it was it did not act like a comet, at least not a very bright and big one. It had no tail and no coma around it. It zipped through, and it could be a long pencil like this, or as you recall, it could also be a flat pancake that we're looking at, John. They never determined which one. And then when it was leaving, it kind of accelerated a little bit. It did not go in a ballistic trajectory, and it... Um, so that it was deter it was decided that this thing is most likely just boiling off remnants of some volatile material and gave it a little jet kick. So, and everybody seized on that as saying it was, uh, especially this Harvard professor, that it was a visiting spacecraft. So let's get this bigger. Yeah, which one and of those? This, which one of those paths is this Borisov? The 2017 path here. Oh, that's it. it. Is the no, that's the um that's Umuamua. Oh, oh, okay, got it. Yeah. And it shows here's a blow up how close it got to the sun. Um, and this is, and you see it's an open orbit, open orbit. It's a comes and goes in a hyperbola. It's open, it never closes. Typical things from our Oort cloud or the Kuiper Belt, they're in a closed ellipse like this. This is a typical comet for us. This is uh, the comet Borisov. Uh, its trajectory, it is also open like um, Oumuamua was, but um, it, it, it is a comet. It has a coma, it has a tail. Um, you could see stuff coming off of it. So it's not a spacecraft, unless they were clever at it. But it's what not they one did, of, go ahead. It's not one of ours. No, definitely. So what they did was there were good observations of this, as there were of Oumuamua too. But Oumuamua, we got that after it passed close to the sun. This one, I believe, was seen a uh, more extensive part of its orbit. So we got some uh, good data on it. Now, it takes three observations of a um, object in space to deter, ideally, to determine its uh, trajectory like this. 
or minimally at least. Minimally, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and more, it depends on the quality of your data too, um, whether it requires more or not. But so they've been taking data on this thing as it went through, and they've traced it back to a star system called sort of called called um let's see Kruger where 60 what's that yeah Kruger 60 and it passed by Kruger 60 in that solar system a million years ago but you've got to keep in mind that comet Borisov passed 5.7 light years from the center of Kruger 60 so it was not a near pass it's actually closer to our sun than it ever was to Kruger 60. So it's just associated with Kruger 60. It's probably not, a, was never a member <clears throat> orbiting Kruger 60. But the most interesting thing about this in tracing it back, when it traveled in toward our sun, it was traveling down a gravitational well. So it was being attracted to our sun all this time, a million years, and it gained a lot of speed. So it went through our system pretty quickly because it, it had enough speed to escape our system again out the other side. It, it was not going to get captured in an orbit. So um, when it was back at Kruger 60, it was traveling only two miles per second. That's pretty slow. That's actually about 8,500 miles per hour. That's half of orbital speed. So it couldn't have been around orbiting any planet in that system. It was probably something that just um, was accelerated toward that system, but it was far away and it, it um, had to pull away from the system. And so Kruger 60 pulled it back to where it's quite slow. Well, hell, you and Chuck have a Tesla that goes that fast almost, don't you? <laughs> we have a what? Tesla car. <laughs> oh, Tesla. <laughs> Now, 8,500 miles an hour is, is pretty fast for a speed on Earth, but it's half of uh, orbital speed for us. So it's a surprisingly low value for being in that vicinity. So they're trying to figure out what that means in terms of, was it thrown out of that system somehow? Uh, what went on? The, I, the, the article that I got this from was discussing more about the fact that if the more of these that we can discover, the pretty soon we're going to... we're we're going to be able to get information about other stellar systems that we don't now have from studying these things as they started down our gravitational well to come to us. And there's talk of pre-positioning a satellite out there or, a, you know, a probe that um, they could then redirect if they spot an incoming interstellar object and, and ride along with it. And get a chemical composition for it. Now, we do have spectral chemical compositions for this already but uh oh, John, this thing went by in, in 2019 of course we right that's correct 2019 and, and jerry and from your talking points like this somebody an amateur spotted this this was a, yeah. a well a crimean observer huh. it's four it's four years old it's not happening now it's not happening now no well, it's taken them this long to do the analysis and get uh sufficient data uh observations to be able to trace the path back accurately. And they think they've done that now. And those were old designations down there because they renamed Oumuamua I-1 for Interstellar 1, and they renamed Borisov I-2 for Interstellar 2. Right. But since then, they've found uh, in declassified US Navy radar data, a, a one that was even earlier than Oumuamua. Um, so I don't know how they're going to designate that one. Well, zero. Can I, I get zero. some? Can I get some explanation here, gentlemen? Sure. What, we see the flat platter of the ecliptic there. Of the Most of the solar system is on a flat platter, but right. there is an Oort cloud, which is a big shell. Yes. I've understood that that's where we get most of our comets. Why the hell couldn't that green line we're seeing there have come out of the Oort cloud? Because it's, it's an unclosed orbit. I mean, the Oort cloud things are orbiting our sun. Uh -huh. But so, sometimes something comes along and nudges them out. Yeah, but they don't, they don't gain enough speed to be in an interstellar orbit that way. In general, I mean, something, if in an improbable situation, but it could occur. You could pick up some something from a, a close pass to a large object, maybe oh. Planet X or something. 
Okay, so the direction and the speed of these things it tells science that's not from our solar system or our, our cloud. It's that's correct, definitely from another. But there's an assumption in that. There's an assumption that uh, it hasn't come near any other object, so it's not one of these very strange, improbable situations. We assume that when we see this pass through, it's always been on this path. That assumption may not always be valid. If it came by a black hole, you wouldn't see that, but it would, it would certainly affect its orbit. Yeah. But if it came within, what did you say, five um, thousand, five light years of the Kruger system, that's further from that star than we are from our nearest south. That's correct. That's the, yeah, that was the first thing that came to my mind. So associating it with the Kruger solar system and being possibly a member of that solar system, I think that is reaching too much. <clears throat> Did they ID where I, Oumuamua came from? Have you said that already? And I course, we don't know somewhere. exactly. What, we know the general direction Oumuamua came from, but we don't associate it with a specific star system. Okay. But this one has a tail. So it's got this some, one has a tail, had a tail. Has some moisture on board of some sort. Well, it could be carbon dioxide, could be carbon monoxide. That's true. Wow. And it looks like it has all the regular indications of a of a comet, right? Yeah, comets come with two tails mm -hmm. sometimes, don't they? So Oumuamua was uh, its path comes from the uh, region of Vega. Oh, that's right. It could have been Vega, and there's no chance that it would capture any of these guys, and they just stay in in a long elliptical orbit forever. One and... one object cannot capture another object. It takes three objects involved to it. Someone has to carry that extra energy away that it would have used to pass through the system. Well, I've heard that planets capture rocks and they become moons. Yep. If it passed very close to Jupiter, Jupiter could swing it in toward the sun and the sun could swing it back out in a new elliptical orbit around in our solar system. And then it becomes a solar system object. That's Very how you get short period comets, we think, from the, from the Oort cloud. They get perturbed by Jupiter and end up getting captured into an orbit that's now closer to the sun. Right. Wow. What a time we live in. Capital I, right? This Jupiter is, is our um, line man, you might say. It takes, it, it takes all the hits for the team <laughs> and yeah. keeps it, the, inner, the inner solar system relatively clean of uh, killers. Well, it could throw stuff in, too, but it can. Luckily, most of that's been used up. I've heard the solar system referred to as nothing but uh, Jupiter plus a lot of debris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> We're sitting on debris. Ah, here we go. Let's make here we go. the Magellan Telescope, named for the world traveler who was, uh, what was he, Portuguese? Magellan? Is I don't know. So I think so. Okay. Yeah, it sounds Portuguese. Somehow Arizona is trying to make a big, huge mirror that can stay together and won't warp at that the, point. The um, mirror, the Arizona has the major mirror lab in this country. It produces mirrors of a standard 8.2 meters, I think. Jeez, that's and, uh... and it it hit on that size because if you tip the mirror once it's done, if you tip the mirror at a 45 degree angles, you can just get it out of the freight door to the laboratory where they make it. So uh, they, they made them that size. Now this is the mold right around there. That's the mold. And these guys here are placing by hand, they're placing chunks of broken um, glass. Um, and I mean glass in a general term, whether it's quartz or- Borosilicate? Yeah, borosilicate. Um, I'm not sure the composition of it, but uh, borosilicate would be Pyrex. So um, anyway, you see all this is piled together, broken glasses, glass of a certain size. And so it'll take a certain amount of time for this. Glass doesn't really melt, as you know. It just becomes uh, less and less viscous as the temperature goes up. Now, this second ring around here, that's a heater element. And up above, but you can't see it. But when they get this all placed, they will lower the top down on and it will be this big kettle with a dome on it and heating elements inside and they'll heat the whole thing up until they melt all this stuff together. 
now until all of it flows together. And then in the furnace, uh, this stuff rotates. And so as the thing be melts and becomes a, uh, a fluid, it assumes the shape of a parabola. So that takes away the need for any kind of significant glass removal from rough grinding. I didn't understand. What does that mean? I don't understand. Well, Ron, it normally if you, just, if, you just had a, if you just had a cylindrical blank, you'd have to carve out a parabola in it. Yeah, yeah. they took tons of glass out of the Hale telescope, Ron. And yeah. they, in, this, a, in this case, they're spinning this hmm. disc. They're spinning the mirror once it turns into a viscous. Um, Non-viscous. You mean yeah, spinning it? it spinning less it, viscous. Less viscous, spin, yeah. Spinning it sends the glass to the edges and gives yeah. it yeah. a... Yep. Yep. Shape. If you take a flat pan of water and you spin it on a very good bearing, the surface of the water will move to an exact parabola. And they have made telescopes like this that point straight up where they have a big, big uh, tub of mercury metal, liquid metal, and they spin it at a certain rate and it's a certain F number telescope. Liquid I've, never I've never understood why it spins to a parabola and not a sphere. Well, I guess you haven't done the, the uh, algebra homework. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. That's, a, that's a homework problem. Oh, okay. And then there's also the way the weight is distributed. Um, there's also, a, and I got this wrong once and Bruce corrected me, but the, um, the way a rope hangs in a gravitational field hangs between two points. There's a name for that. A catenary. catenary. A what? Catenary. Catenary, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So that's also that's also a high school algebra problem. But all the mirrors in your scopes, gentlemen, are parabolas. They are, but we carve them to be that way. We don't flow them. Well, uh, Ron, uh, that's that's in a reflector in telescope. That's in a that's in a Newtonian telescope. Right. right. In the Schmidt Cassegrains, it's a spherical mirror, and that's why you need a corrector plate. But they both focus. To one point, right? No, no. Spherical mirror does not. So you need to use a corrective line. element. The spherical mirror all by itself uh, focuses to a curve that's called a caustic. Hmm. Hmm. We're, we're, we're talking a part of the sphere, just a part of it, not the equivalent of an arc on a circle, but this is a piece of... Right. If you cut, cut the bottom third of a basketball off, that's the right. spherical mirror. And that won't reflect back to one single point? No. No. Now, well, it will if the uh, source is at the uh, focal length of the mirror. It, it's in the, if you, yeah, the way, the way I've heard this is if, you, if you're standing in the center, Ron, of a, of a sphere uh, and, the, and you're in the inside and the, and the inside of the glass sphere is mirrorized and you're standing at the center and you look out and you're holding a candle and if that candle is in focus, you're standing at what they call the radius of curvature. So yeah, it'll come back to, to you, but starlight is parallel. It's not that candle. <clears throat> oh. So it has to be reshaped to a parabola shape. It just seems like the law of geometry would force it to every angle, you know, depending. No, no, no okay. it doesn't. It doesn't I'll, come I'll, to different- I'll show you that on a blackboard someday. It doesn't work. Yep. Love the uh, big telescopes that are the two big radio telescopes at Arecibo and the one in China, I forget where they are. Those are spherical radio telescopes and they have an antenna that's at the center of curvature, but the antenna is a long thing that sticks down because that antenna is picking up over the entire caustic curve. So it's getting, that's, the, that's as close to a focal point as you get in a sphere. Is it the same with radio telescopes, metal? It is, yeah, yes. Optics applies to radio waves, just like visible light. So this is um, this is a finished mirror for the uh, place in Arizona is the Stewart Observatory Mirror Lab, see deck here. And this is, um, the glass is produced by O'Hara. And this is a completed mirror for the Magellan Telescope. And, oh. and this this lab is under their football stadium, I believe. It's yeah, it is. <laughs> and now this is oh. this is a map up here, GMT written right here on Chile, on this side of the Andes. 
and this is where it's going to be placed. And this is the site where they're going to put it up. There's no construction that started yet when this picture was taken, and I don't know exactly where it's going to set. Um, but there is some telescopes and activity already there. Boy, no, 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 no vegetation, boy. That's got to be up there. It's, uh, it's dry. It's right above the Atacama Desert. It's great for uh, trying to get um, um, infrared information, shortwave infrared. Wow. And it also uh, it is, um, has very little water in the atmosphere. Wow. Very little cloudy That's days. Cool. Now, this is an artist drawing of the uh, giant Magellan telescope. You see that it's got seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The center one's got a hole in it. And the center one is a symmetrical parabola. The rest of these are off-axis parabolas. Just And the way to picture that surface is just to picture that there's one big mirror that's all the way around here. And then you just cut out this with a circular disc cutter. You cut out these individual circular discs except that's a very clumsy way to make the telescope. So they're just making the disc and grinding it to the right shape or polishing it to the right shape. Yeah, so it means they have to take that parabola that they got in the Stewart mirror lab right. and modify it. Right. What, why would you say a symmetrical uh, mirror? Why, what's asymmetrical? Are they mostly asymmetric? They're not balanced? Off-axis mirrors are not symmetrical. They, they focus to the side. Oh. This is fascinating. I had no idea there was such a varying sizes and shapes and okay, that, all the different. Now worlds. this up here is the Yerkes Observatory 40 inch uh, refractor F23, um, opened in 1893. It's now a tourist attraction and uh, give public viewings every now and then. And this is the largest usable 40 inch or 40 inches, the largest refractor. There was a larger refractor built um, in Paris called the Great Paris Telescope. It was set up, but it wasn't really functional. It's, it was a 90 inch, I think, or 60 inch. So 60, but it, yeah. it laid flat in a, in a basement and it used uh, celostats, uh, uh, rotating flat out front to point it and look at different things but it was uh, not very useful and it was inside a city. And this was before they realized that they needed to put telescopes away from city lights and away from city vibrations. Wow. So <laughs> this is the hundred inch telescope, the Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson, the Hale telescope, which is a 200 inch on Mount Palomar. These were the, these were the, these are away on um, sites devoted to astronomy. In the case of Mount Wilson, Los Angeles grew up and destroyed the night skies in the up uh, Mount Wilson. <laughs> so these are these are multiple mirror telescopes on Mount Hopkins in Arizona. Um, this one was used from 1979 to 1998, and it's no longer in operation. The 1999 telescope is still operating there. Wow. So Russia made Russia made it when Russia saw that the U.S. had made a 200-inch telescope in the late second half of the 1940s. They decided they were going to make a 400-inch telescope, and so a 300 or 400, but a bigger one. And so they did that, but it was out of poor glass, and they didn't do a good job. And so it was a very poor telescope. Uh, it never really contributed much. It was built in 1975. It was, I guess it was earlier than that, it was refigured to be a better telescope. And so I believe it's still operating. And I always thought James Webb was a monster, but look at it. It's a dinky one in the lower left. Yeah, well, compared to Hubble, you know, but this, these have the advantage of being out in space. So that counts for a lot of um, resolution. They're actually operating at, at uh, theoretical resolution limits because they don't have bad seeing days. What is the largest monolithic uh, telescope uh, in existence right now? Not the not the segmented, but the monolithic is is it the uh, that Russian one or is it Gemini? No, no. See these these ones up here are bigger than that. The Subaru, the yeah. Gemini North, um, and then there's a Gemini South, which is a duplicate of that in Chile. Um, 
and the large binocular telescope in uh, Mount, Mount Graham in Arizona. These are all, and this one, the very large telescope, these are using the uh, mirrors made at the Arizona mirror maker shop. And so you see they're all the same size. They're all 8.2 meters. There's the Magellan telescopes, and this is the giant Magellan telescope. Boy, if we could get something like that, that size in space, we'd, God knows what we could see. Uh huh. Now, this is the 30 meter telescope, which people are working on right now. It's planned to open in 2027. It's going to be built on Hawaii. And this is the one that the indigenous um, people oh, were testing yeah. against. But they yeah. reached an agreement where there would be no more telescopes on the mountain um, after the 30 meter. And uh, the uh, and this is the extremely large telescope, the ELT, spated to go up in uh, Amazon in uh, Chile, planned for twenty twenty seven. But I'm not sure that is actually going ahead right now. Does anyone have any update on that? I don't. I don't know. The ELT. They they stopped one of them. Uh, but there was a bigger one than this, and I think they stopped that one. Well, that's that overwhelmingly large telescope. That's yeah. the light gray big circle. Yeah. The owl, the overwhelmingly large. Yeah, I, I don't know about the extremely large. I, I haven't heard any update on that. Mm -hmm. Wasn't well, that big, big decommissioned radio telescope in Puerto Rico about that size? That sort of decommissioned itself. Well, it's it's that, on but... this graph, Ron. If you look, it's on this picture. Arecibo Observatory at the bottom there, 305 meters. So it's it's oh it's off the page. Oh wow. Well, it's see very the, much off yeah, the see page. the curve here is the partial curve there. I see. I just and then that bottom one, the darker gray, that's the Chinese radio telescope. Right. Wow. Oh, there's the, the there's the owl. Uh, or the, or it's overwhelmingly large. Oh, yeah. This is I this one, yeah. This is the overwhelmingly large, the owl. And it's been canceled. Wow! So now yeah. they combined the they combined the images on on is it Gemini? They they combined images. No, it's the VLT, the very large telescope there, where you see four of them. Yeah, <laughs> it, they can I, treat I, it as an interferometer. Yeah, I don't understand inter interferometry, but they they take they take the the light from each telescope, combine them, and it becomes literally a larger telescope. Yes, it has right. effectively the distance between the mirrors is the effective aperture and defines the resolution in that dimension. Okay, but it doesn't make the uh, light the, that much bigger. I mean, it's no. just... yeah. But they're all laid out in segments, aren't they? Because you can't possibly make one single mirror that big, can you? No, no. It looks like they might have been considering that for the overwhelmingly large telescope from this diagram, but hard to tell. I, I don't. I don't think it's possible. It's yeah. just it, it, the 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 sa the sagging would be incredible. They'd have to like with the Hale telescope. Some of the hollow there's hollows behind the mirror, and they had a mechanical computer behind that to compensate for the slewing of the telescope as it moved around the sky. That huge chunk of glass. It would deform, so they had to compensate for that by these mechanical computers. So that would really compound the uh, uh, having one monolithic huge mirror. That's mm -hmm. what that's the beauty of these multi-segmented telescopes. They they have the we were talking about that before we came on and how they have little motors and stuff to uh, to adjust them. So the um, the mirror that we saw being formed at the very top with the uh, individual pieces of glass being placed by hand. Uh, that's the last mirror of the seven. And when that mirror is done, then they'll they'll uh, assemble this on site. Right above it is a ring. Did you go over that one? What is that? The, the Vera C. Rubin telescope? Yeah. That's, that uses a mirror like this, but the central obscu obscuration is very big. Okay. Because it's got a giant camera, the biggest camera ever made. Um, and it so it takes snapshots of a very wide field of part of the sky every night. Oh, Which is turning into multiple, multiple group shots of Starlink satellites. Right. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> good, they good all, one, Chuck. And and do they all come with the programming or the software that decommissions the the uh, waving effect of the upper atmosphere? You know, no, what I mean? not all of them, but these days that's pretty useful. Yeah, that requires a sodium laser and a rubber mirror. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, AI is mostly done with the secondary or tertiary mirror, not with the primary. Generally tertiary. Primary is maintained. The primary is too massive to respond quickly like that. By the way, the uh, Las Cumbres Observatory one meter scopes have uh, micro manipulators in back to distort the uh, surface yeah. of the mirror into perfection. Oh, oh really? Right. I didn't know that. Yeah. The... Uh, the great group that was here in town that made cameras for amateurs, uh, Santa Barbara Instrument Group, SBIG, or SBIG, who used to live in the Clinet building here on uh, Hollister Avenue, they made an AI for amateurs. And it was, a, it was a flat mirror that was tightly sprung and it would track, um, it would take out a bad seeing effect that translate didn't distort the image, but dis, but translated the image. So it would monitor a star, and then it would it would rotate or tip and tilt the secondary mirror to keep the star in position. It would watch the um, the atmospheric disturbances that translated the object. So it would take the translation error out, but it wouldn't take out distortions on an extended object like Jupiter. What was what was that called, Jerry? That that type of uh, uh, where you have a rubberized mirror. There's a certain name for that. that adaptive type. optics. Adaptive optics. Yeah. Adaptive optics. Yeah. AO. And I we had a couple that... speakers that spoke about that uh, okay. a couple of years ago. Andy, no, they need a small mirror because they typically correct the surface of the of the um, distorting mirror a thousand times a second. Yeah. They shoot an. They shoot an. A, a, a synthetic star into the sky with a big artificial laser. star. It's it's a sodium star, right? Yeah, and they look and they at the returning light, and they have a closed loop feedback system that looks at the uh, uh, corrected waveform coming off the rubber mirror, and you know it's a two dimensional Fourier transform. They got to do to figure out all the little manipulators where they got to move to get rid of that. Well, do you suppose you can see a display of photographs of the same celestial objects done by every one of these telescopes just to compare? Yeah. I'll dig it up for next time. Really? They have them, huh? Oh, yeah. What I didn't realize is at the bottom uh, edges of this image here, there's a tennis court and a basketball court, and that's the uh, that's used for a reference of the size. I, I, I thought they were going to be bigger than that, but they're but I mean, they're big enough. And then there's a human being there just above the basketball court. Yeah, see this guy right there? Yeah, that's, oh boy. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're big. They're big. <clears throat> well, we've certainly made up for not getting to Magellan a week or two ago, I've got to tell you, because we got 10, 12 minutes left to cover five, six other things. So what do you want to eliminate? The Cygnus Loop? The uh, Constellation Pegasus region of the Great Square? Whatever and anyone's interested in. The moon, of course, waxing in the crescent stage this week. Oh, and, let's do the screaming skull. Oh, yeah. Happy yes. Halloween, everybody. Let's Tom Whittemore likes is, that cluster. Could, I'd really Carolyn like to throws. know more about this. I just, I've never looked at it. And, and you said it has another name? You've looked at it. It's Carolyn's Rose. Yeah. And I, I've looked at that? Yeah. Tom huh. Whittemore loves to show it. Okay. It's NGC 7789, right? Well, we'll be checking that out at Westmont this next Friday. We're going to be looking. Okay. Uh, well, Here's... also this next Friday, unless my uh, calendar is wrong, is the uh, uh, annual outing at Lake Kachuma. It is. But it's also Westmont. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But two outreaches in one day, huh? Well, Kachuma is not an outreach. It's not? It's, no, it's, a... it's, it's just our camp out. Yeah. Does the camp out uh, terminate on Sunday? Well, you got to leave on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and the potluck dinner is then on Friday or Saturday? Saturday night. Saturday, Saturday night at 5 p.m. Oh, then I could go to Westmont and go to the Kachuma. You could. Yeah. Oh, cool. I didn't, I enjoy it, Bruce. Okay. This is uh, the W 
Oh, see, right, www, right there. <laughs> Rupa, <laughs> Navi, Shader, and Calf. And just up from Calf, almost 90 degrees up and across forming a square from this guy up there is the object of tonight's desire. And that is NGC. Oh. Ah. There. Oh. So um, the best I can't, I don't know. It doesn't look like a skull to me. There's kind of a little smile there. Maybe that's a jaw or something. Looks like a square collection of stars. But Stephen James O'Meara of Astronomy Magazine uh, has this labeled as one of his objects in the Halloween object list. Oh, I see it. It you looks do? like Howdy Doody's face, and you can see his chin. Is pointing yeah. down to about five o'clock. There's two ears. One is around two o'clock. One is around eight o'clock. And you can see two eyes that are between the two ears. Hmm. Yeah, I can see a skull that's kind of facing downward towards 7 p.m. Clock face wise. Oh, you can do that too. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah, there's at kind of a little skull. dark area here with uh, and yeah, the, yeah, two the eyes and a nose. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And there's I. Oh, yeah. It does look like. Yeah. I. I. Nose and a frowning mouth. Yeah. I. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good find. So well, the one that pops out to me looks like Howdy Doody. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a globular cluster. No, that's an open cluster. Yeah, it's open an open cluster. cluster. Hmm. It's uh, uh, it's called as Chuck pointed out. It's called Carolyn's Rose. Uh, because it was discovered by Carolyn Herschel in 1783. Is that old man, man Herschel's wife, the one that His discovered sister. you? Sister, oh, yeah. sister. Oh. And this is seven NGC, New General Catalog 7789, which Carolyn Herschel also put together. Okay, that's good. I'm going to be able to talk about this on Friday. This is this this is nice. The screaming yeah, skull cluster is due to Stephen James O'Meara. Yeah, we should name something after her. The Carol, something Carol Planet or Moon. It is Carol Rose. Rose. Oh, is that what this is called? Carol. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Carol yes. Okay. And a thousand stars in that sector. Once again, the difference between an open cluster and a globular cluster, and the other clusters. Open clusters are younger stars. They were often called galactic clusters because they're concentrated along the plane of the galaxy. Globular okay. clusters are very old stars. Uh, they're more strongly gravitationally bound, and they're usually tens of thousands of light years away. And usually in a sphere. Yeah. Okay. And somehow you get a skull out of that. And I see it. Okay. Happy Halloween, guys. Bruce, why do you have a second screen on the... Because that's on my big computer. Were you going to, if we could get it in, show your shots of the uh, partial eclipse? I think you took those, didn't you? You sent them to uh, us. I did. Um, <clears throat> I guess. Uh, yeah, how do I do this? I, I'm not used to doing. Uh, yeah, we got one there. Here's there. one. Oh, you can pull it. I, I, I sent that email twice. The first time I sent it, I uh, uh, attached a wrong picture, like this okay. one. This one my daughter took. Oh, OK. This was taken by Bruce's uh, daughter. Oh, and if you look real close, you can see little irregularities around the moon. That's the hills and valleys in silhouette around the sun. The spots and aren't showing. The what? Oh, the, no, sun the spots, spots didn't show. show. There is something right there. Okay. I'll go up. If you go There's to the collage, one up the there, big one, the one that's, I don't know, three megabytes, uh, that's all of the pictures that were taken. And unfortunately, the, um, uh, cell phone cameras, you don't have a whole lot of control over exposure. So yeah. this is overexposed. Yeah. But there's some other uh, pictures in that collage that are not overexposed. And you can see, uh, yeah. I think, uh, eight sunspots or something like that. Now, a lot of those features, um, not to disagree with Bruce, but in a lot of cameras, a lot of those features are there, but they're very obscure. That's, that's exactly right. I'm sure that if you know how to use it, you could use it. But uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, did anybody is, get this, a, anybody get a one. picture at Camino Real? So that's where we well, are. That's what this is. is. 
This is it. Text. See, this is Camino Real. I know. This but did you get has appeared in Newshawk and um, The Independent. And, and I, there's a nice article by Robert Bernstein on Ed Hat. Yes, okay. there is. Chuck and powder in that. But I think I think this was taken by Bruce. No, this was. Um, it was in your email. Yeah, I know, but I believe this was Newshawk. Um, okay. It, can I, you? Let, let me go to that. Um, come on, where am I here? <clears throat> I you guys have got to make this smaller. My Wait. Zoom is full screen, and I can't. There we go. Now um, <clears throat> I can get into my uh, directories here. Can you make it bigger so we can see what's on the theater marquee? What are they watching nowadays? The Taylor Swift movie and this Oppenheimer still up there. Barbie, God knows. Are what you ready to um, share, Bruce? I'm getting down to the uh, files that have what I want. Um, but my question was, did anybody take picture or a picture out there at the event? Yes. That's yes, what that last picture we showed was right there. Oh, okay. I yeah. But if you go to my email, the one I sent out this morning where I said I, I had attached the wrong wrong uh, picture, you'll see uh, eight pictures that, that uh, I uploaded from uh, the, the thing there, uh, five of which are what we took, we being Marlon, my daughter, and Bonnie, my wife. You know, we got to be careful of, as far as showing pictures with recognizable children's faces in them, unless we have a release of some kind. So, yeah, probably. But, well, it's uh, a public space. You can take any kind of pictures you want in a public space. Uh, got to be careful. Yeah, these days. Owen was getting signature. Okay, this is one of Bruce's collages. Uh, is that showing okay? Yeah, and now you can zoom in on that. That's a, a the one that says that doesn't say small or. or whatever it, it's uh those are the full-size photos that i put into a collage yeah so you can see sunspots very nicely on here huh. i don't know why they're located over here that might be i don't think i rotated one of the pictures i had no control over the photographers which way they put their camera up to the uh yeah, but this yeah. wouldn't be an effect of the camera because this is um well, that's the rotation of the camera. Yeah, there's, you know, the, my my uh, expert photographers uh, put their cell phones up in one way or another on the uh, yeah against the eyepiece, and I had no control. I was too busy talking to people and showing them the uh, yeah the, the clips through the big scope. That one sunspot that's right near where the moon takes a bite out of the sun. It's it's right at that it, at kind of the apex of the curve. And oh, I see what's happened one. here. This picture's out of order. This is coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. Maximum going out and going out. Oh, all right. Well, I can re reorder that. Yeah. <laughs> those two in the middle that are a little bit wrinkly. Uh, my wife took those with her Pixel cat with a cell phone. The uh -huh. rest of them, my daughter took with her Android cell phone. Okay. Yeah, can a lot I of people tried tried to use their solar or uh, their uh, cell phone on my telescope and most of it worked pretty good but well, i'm you know i was over the side of my I, I could see since i have a diagonal on the finder scope when people would put their camera up there i'm i'm, I'm looking at the angle of the camera with respect to the center line of the eyepiece and they they tend to tilt the camera and i keep saying i'll put my hand up there and say, so you want to be 90 degrees to my hand and if yeah. they don't then you get you know um distortions john Flare. boyd who's our sort of solar expert guy he didn't he wasn't able to join us out of community rail marketplace but he took some really nice pictures uh both through uh photo you know uh white light filter and through uh hydrogen alpha and they're posted on newshawk now so um they're pretty impressive yeah yeah he did a quite a lot job. of detail in that big sunspot mm -hmm. so i had one one little boy reached up his mother lifted him up and he reached out and grabbed my telescope like he was going to do chin-ups yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I had, to spend, I had to spend some time refocusing and getting it back on it is just almost instinctive for me when a kid starts to reach i just raise my hand and push his arms out of the way yeah and then i say please don't touch the telescope 
Now, the filters involved in this are similar to uh, welders' goggles, aren't they? They're really dark and smoky, right? When well, these, done. well, they're not. I didn't use a glass filter. It's a mylar filter that's been metalized on both sides, and it's an ND5, which means 10 to the fifth attenuation, or one part in 100,000. So but let's do one one hundred thousandth of the light. But how do you get it on your scope? Does it screw in? Is it a lens on the edge? Stick edge? it on the front. I, there's a picture of my scope in this this uh, bunch of uh, pictures that I sent it's down near the bottom, probably about the fifth one down. And, and then, okay, and then the glasses that people get were they provided free out there at Camino Real? Uh, no, the museum is selling them. Three dollars oh, each. But the local libraries uh, were giving out free glasses. And and you can't really see anything through them under regular daytime conditions. It's so dark and smoky, like yeah. a welder's goggles, that you can look at the sun. Yes. Just wondering how many druggies got went blind that day. Well, there was a time when we had uh, just just like a uh, one of the weather apps I had said that around nine thirty eight something like that we were going to get a little kiss of the fog, and that's exactly what happened. So we had fog come in just for a short time. And uh, the, the there you the, go. I was trying to find that one. Finally. And it, and people were asking, you know, can we just look up at it? Because you know, it was you could see it naked eye. But I said you shouldn't really do that. So uh, stay for very long. <laughs> I'll bet you a lot of weirdos around though. There's a lot of crazies in the world today. You know, the uh, small the small filter on the small on the Pentax uh, finder scope was uh -huh. given to me by Joe Doyle. And it, it, it fits perfectly. The big one I made, uh, I bought a, that, that's a metalized piece of uh, black plastic. So the image is kind of orange that you see through it. And uh, it was, uh, I only paid like, I think $9 for the filter because it was in a cardboard box and you put together this cardboard thing. So I made what you see there and just took the filter part out of that and put it in this. The uh, ring of this is made out of, uh, of uh, door skin, eighth inch thick plywood. And you can uh, bend that by heating it and bend it into a circle. And then I, I cut out a masonite uh, ring and then cut the middle out to what you see and paint everything black. You know, suppose uh, uh, Bruce, you could put up. You, you know, suppose by a next meeting, you could have a whole bunch of pictures blown up and framed or posted at our meeting. <laughs> I can, um, or just I can I can print them here eight and a half by eleven. Okay. I, I don't know how what you mean by big. It's be easier for me to just put them on a thumb drive, and project them onto the screen. All right, that's your assignment, uh, Jerry. Uh, region of the Great Square, Cygnus Loop, Supernova, Zodiac Light, Gegenschein. We'll postpone that and talk about it next week or future. Yeah, program. I'll look at the timeliness of those things. All right, one, of them, one of them was very close to the Western horizon so the next week it'll be too close chuck what were you saying somebody was saying. no that was me i just said the time went by really fast oh it does you know we don't need any major group watching us we're doing fine on our own just having fun all we don't have is the meal being brought to us by what was that mexican-american young man's name the, the roberto roberto was the waiter i wonder if he's still there well We'll see you at either Westmont or the, the lake over the weekend and back oh, here thanks. next Monday. And uh, we'll have a good time, gentlemen. Take care of your lovely ladies and 